In our last session, we saw the basic structure of systems and the framework of relationships that hold them together and allow them to produce results. In this session, we turn to the use of models. Models are a particularly powerful tool for acquiring and managing a system's view of a complex system. Models do not forget or lose track of the details. They retain the elements and relationships as the modeler has entered them and can be used to simulate the logical structure of the system in order to predict the results that will be produced by that system. Having said that, models are a fact of life. While the statement that there is no such thing as engineering or problem solving without models may be surprising at first blush, the truth is that without models, there is no way to think about or communicate our ideas about the system, either the problem or the solution. The issue becomes where the model resides. In many instances, we retain in our heads a model of the reality we wish to consider or communicate. In this case, we attempt to use words to describe the mental models which we have formulated. Very often, the words of our descriptions are inexact or downright inaccurate. They can create a misimpression in the minds of our hearers. Those who listen to our descriptions can even misinterpret the best description. Everyone has played the so-called telephone game where a word or phrase is passed around a circle of people from one to the other. The original always returns as something different by the time it reaches the end. This is because the idea is passed from one person to another through an imperfect medium of communication. The idea is heard, reinterpreted, and recommunicated by each person in turn. That is what happens when the model of a system is allowed to remain solely in the heads of the designers. That problem can only be addressed by using a single, visible, instantiated model somewhere that all can access it directly. The difference between using a variety of mental models to create and communicate the design using a single tangible visible model is that in the latter case each person involved is viewing the same model without interpretation. In surfacing the model all changes and additions are visible in real time and confusion is greatly reduced. This is the idea behind model-based systems engineering. But what is a model as we are using that term in this discussion? For the purpose of this discussion, a model is a limited representation of an underlying reality that can be migrated into a cohesive, unambiguous representation of a system. While it is limited, it is not, after all, the reality itself, it includes all the aspects of the underlying reality related to its purpose. It is important to note here that what we are describing is model-based systems engineering. That requires more than a simple involvement of the model in the systems engineering process. Just because models are put to some use in the engineering process, does not make that process model-based. To be model-based engineering must be grounded in a system model that includes all the relevant elements structured in the right relationship to each other. There are serious misunderstandings about this very important concept. Being model-based does not mean that the design simply involves a model or models in some respect. The model in this case is the foundation of the design. It is a model that will support a cohesive, unambiguous representation of the system that is its subject. There are numbers of models which are very valid and useful for their purposes, but are inadequate to become the basis for a system's design. 
The statistician George E.P. Box is famous for saying, all models are wrong, but some are useful. In that statement, he alludes to the fact that all models are limited in some way in representing the reality to which they point. In not being a complete representation, Box claims that they are wrong. His observation is correct in that sense. Box later restated the idea in a more useful way by saying, remember that all models are wrong. The practical question is how wrong do they have to be to not be useful? The answer to his practical question is controlled by the model's purpose. A model is not useful when it does not serve its purpose. It must hold everything necessary to its purpose outside the terms of its limitations. When we judge the utility of a system's model, we use the purpose of that model as our measuring stick. The model is used to help us gain insight into the structure and properties of the system it represents. This is the measure of its utility. Consider the following examples. Models are limited representations of reality. In order to be useful, the limitations imposed must not exclude the representation of any relevant aspects of the reality being described. For example, a plastic model of a ship or plane, which is constructed for the purpose of representing the appearance of the real vehicle, should look like the real thing. Absolute size isn't critical and would actually be a detriment, but proportionality is. Therefore, the model is typically scaled down in size to fit on the display surface, but maintains the proportions of its various parts. Cosmetic appearance features, like the paint scheme, would also be important to the display model. These would need to be faithful to reality in order to preserve an accurate depiction of its appearance. With a model made for testing the durability and resilience of structures in a wind tunnel, however, the materials and support configurations would be critical to the model's purpose, where the paint scheme and cosmetic appearance would not. The critical factor in delineating the relevance of the particular limitations in the model's representation of reality is the purpose of the model. The idea is that the value of the model as a representation of reality is directly related to its purpose. Just as a plastic model constructed using rubber cement would be worthless in a wind tunnel test, a much larger scale wind tunnel model painted gunmetal gray would be out of place as a desktop display model. The value of the model is determined by the degree to which it fulfills its purpose. The same model may be very valuable for one purpose and nearly useless for another. Answering Box's practical question boils down to the purpose of the model. The point at which a model becomes too wrong for it to be useful is when it crosses the line of failing to fulfill its purpose. If a model is limited in a way that makes it impossible for it to meet its purpose, then it is no longer useful. With a systems model, the purpose is to observe the system and the interaction of its parts. The model must be robust enough to encompass the system components and their relationships. Its viewpoint is the system level description. In this way, it serves the system's engineering of the reality it represents. In order to use a model to understand an existing or proposed system, it must represent the structure, behavior, and interfaces of the system within its environment. The framework for such a systems model includes the definition of the purposes of the system, the system behavior that accomplishes those purposes, and the structure that produces the behavior. We call that framework a schema, 
which contains the elements in domains, the requirements, the behavior, and the physical architecture. Any lesser representation that breaks the system apart in some way is not a true system model. That is because it cannot accurately reflect the nature of the system. Here we again point back to Capra's warning that the system properties are destroyed when the system is dissected, either physically or theoretically, into isolated elements. A model of one class of system elements or of a single component or subsystem may be useful for testing component performance, for example, but it is not the system model contemplated for model-based systems engineering. One way this commonly happens is through the use of domain-specific models. Because these models are limited to one or two of the domains involved in a true systems model, they cannot offer the kind of systems view necessary for gaining the insight into the system design. This is often excused by representing that these limited models can be used in combination to obtain the system's view in the aggregate. In reality, this is an argument that the real systems model would again reside in the minds of the designers, with partitioned models providing the information for the larger picture. That simply places the burden of constructing and maintaining the systems model back on the designer, denying them the use of a visible model. This also happens when we're encouraged to use models that are intended for an entirely different purpose, such as physics-based performance models, as the basis for our model-based systems engineering. Once again, these models do not offer the systems view required for model-based systems engineering design work. Valuable for their intended purpose, these models are inadequate as the basis for system design. In these instances, the models fail because their limitations make them inadequate for the purpose of providing the necessary systems view. They're perfectly adequate for their intended purpose, but are not suitable to support model-based systems engineering. The definition of the system gives us the foundation for talking about systems. We can see three distinct ways in which we can describe the three aspects of the definition. The definition calls for different elements. These elements are the building blocks of the system. The structure of the system, be it called a construct or collection, holds the elements in relationship to each other. The characteristics of the relationships that bind together the elements and the system determine the results produced by the system. As our colleagues in the behavioral sciences like to say, it's all about the relationships. Nowhere is that more true than in describing systems and their results. In order to fully describe the systems, we must be able to provide detailed descriptions of the elements and the relationships. In order to do this, we assign attributes to them. The attributes describe a particular element or relationship in relevant detail. If we were to use a language analogy for this description system, we would say that the elements are nouns, the relationships are verbs, and the attributes are adjectives or adverbs, depending upon whether they are assigned to elements or relationships. This offers us the basic parts from which we can construct a language that will describe our system. The language springs directly from the concepts set out in the definition. While we will develop more details around the description of systems, these concepts form the fundamentals. Departing from them can lead to trouble, while understanding and observing their implications can be a very useful guide. Into that model framework, we integrate the validation, is this the right solution, 
and the verification. Is the solution right? We use elements, relationships, and attributes as the building blocks for the model. Within the framework, it becomes possible to model highly complex systems, whether we are representing existing systems or proposing new ones. The model provides discipline, order, and consistency. What is impossible to track in our memory becomes clear and accessible in the model. From that emerges greater insight. Any lesser model, any model that fails to provide these insights, cannot be the foundation for model-based systems engineering. In this session, we have seen that models provide the mental framework around which we manage our thinking and communication about our designs. Useful insofar as they meet their purposes, Models can be a powerful tool for managing the detail and complexity of systems design. But models that consider only a narrow portion of the design concerns cannot perform the function of providing a systems view. They are not the models upon which model-based systems engineering is grounded. In our next session, we will discuss some of the challenges and pitfalls that await us as we engage in MBSE. We will devote some time to the facets of complexity, which is a major issue in our dynamic and increasingly complex world.